Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn in the Old Testament to 1 Samuel chapter 23. As we continue in our series here through the book of 1 Samuel as Israel is in search for a king. 1 Samuel chapter 23 and this morning verses 15 through 18 for our, for our text today. It occurred to me recently that one of the um, kinds of videos that I tend to be drawn to as I'm most of the time wasting time on social media, um, the kind of videos that I'm kind of drawn to watch and engage in are videos of friends uh, doing all sorts of different things. Maybe you've seen some of them. Uh, they are doing crazy pranks on each other or they're doing weird fishing challenges. I like to watch those from time to time. Let's go to Walmart and spend $10 and you can buy whatever lure you want and let's see if we can go catch a fish. And it's friends spending time together. Or this week as I was uh, preparing for this message, it reminded me of the video I had just watched where uh, a group of friends made this gigantic rubber band ball. And they wanted to see how high it would bounce when you drop it off of a four-story tower, right? Um, fun to watch. Uh, friends with friends. There's something about those kinds of things that, that we're probably drawn to, that, that time with friends. But if you knew that the next get-together with your friends was going to be the last time that you would see each other, what would you spend those moments doing? I think we would all agree that in those moments, if you had that knowledge, you would want to make the most of those moments that you have together. Amen? The thing is, though, that most of the time, we go through life and we spend those moments with our friends and our loved ones or with, what, with others, giving little to no thought of that possible reality that this could be the last time that we're together. And the brevity of life is a reality that we can't deny. Uh, the psalmist writes in Psalm chapter 90, he says, teach me to number my days. Why does he say that? Why does he pray and ask God, teach me to number my days? Well, because we don't know how many days we're going to have. There's going to come a point where the end of life is going to happen. And that's what we read in our scripture reading in James chapter 4. For what is your life? What is but a mist or a vapor that appears for a moment and then vanishes away and the illustration is of that of like that breath your breath in the morning on a cold morning we're getting fall here there was some fog earlier this week those cold mornings and you breathe right that vapor of, of breath it appears and then what does it do it just it fades away right and that's what what scripture teaches us about our life in the scheme of eternity it's nothing but a vapor that appears for a moment and then vanishes away and as I studied this text and, and looked again at the interaction between David and Jonathan that we have accounted for in this text, I couldn't help but think how much greater of an impact could our lives have if we went into these occurrences with others with the intentional mindset to make the most of the moments that we have. If we don't know how many that we have, we ought to, as the psalmist says, uh, make the most of them, to count those days, to make sure that we are maximizing the opportunities that we have. And so this morning, as we look at our text here this morning, I want to talk about making the most of the moments that we have with others. And I want to make a very clear distinction here that we're not talking about making the most of the moments that you have to do everything that you want to do to make the most of your life as, as uh, one um, and I use the term pastor loosely, as one pastor would say, right, your best life now. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about making the most of the moments that you have with others. How much greater of an impact could we have if that's how we approached all of the uh, relationships that we have or the encounters that we have with others? If, you, if you're making the most of the moment that you have with your spouse, uh, actively loving your spouse, every chance that you have. Uh, actively nurturing your children in the Lord because you don't know when that influence is going to come to an end. Uh, building up and strengthening a friend because you have been given an opportunity to do so. Edifying the body of Christ. Engaging with the body of Christ, with your fellow church members and those that, you, that we do church with, uh, actively seeking to build them up every opportunity that you have. 
How much greater of an impact could we have if we went into every uh, um, encounter with another individual making sure that they know Jesus? How much greater of an impact could your life have for eternity? And as we come to our text here in 1 Samuel, we look at these few short verses where David and Jonathan are interacting. The question that I want us to consider is, how can we then do that? If this is the reality, the brevity of life is a reality, and we don't know that maybe this is the last chance that we have together, or the, you know, uh, the next time that you gather with a friend is the next chance that you'll have with them. How can you make the most of those moments that you have with this other person, with your friends, your family, your neighbor, the person that you're trying to reach for Jesus? As we come here to our text, in 1 Samuel 23, beginning in verse 15, we find Jonathan is coming to meet David in the wilderness as David is hiding still from King Saul. We find, as we read this text, that this gathering between friends is done secretly and in hiding. Jonathan is the son of the king. Saul, his father, is trying to kill his best friend David. David is in hiding, and so Jonathan goes and finds where he's hiding meet with him, to encourage him. The time that they spend together here in these moments is very brief. Not a lot happens here. It only covers just a few short verses here in the text, uh, but it's not a long, drawn-out time together. It's very brief, very short. As you study Scripture, you don't know this stated directly in this text, but as you look at the rest of 1 Samuel and the uh, the historical account of these events, this is most likely, by all accounts, the last time that they would see each other. They go into this meeting not knowing that this was the reality of their gathering. But what we find is that Jonathan, even without this advanced knowledge, he makes the most of the moment that they have together. He makes the most of the moments he has with his friend. And So let's look here at our text in 1 Samuel 23, beginning in verse 15. The Bible says that David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horish. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horish and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul my father also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horish. And Jonathan went home. There are four things here that I want to call your attention to that I believe will help us make the most of the moments that we have with others. Regardless of what that relationship may be, whether it's a family member, a friend, uh, an acquaintance that you you might have, making the most. Here's four things that I believe will help us make the most of the moments that we have as we learn here from David and Jonathan in this encounter. The first is this, as you think about making the most of the moments that you have, you need to take the initiative to act. Take the initiative to act. You can't wait for the convenient opportunity. You can't wait until next time. You can't wait for the other person to initiate the action. If you're going to make the most of the moments that you have, you have to take the initiative to act. Verses 15 and 16, it says very simply, and it's very subtle. If you just read through, you think it's just, it's just a recording of the events, but it tells us something very important, that Jonathan went to meet David. Jonathan took the initiative to go and see his friend David. It seems kind of funny to look at it this way, but if Jonathan had waited for David to come to him, or if he would have waited for a more convenient time for them to get together as friends, to encourage one another, to, to help one another, if they would have waited uh, and, and Jonathan hadn't taken the initiative here, uh, their gathering wouldn't have happened, would it? If he would have been waiting for David to make the first move, he would have been waiting a long time because David was in hiding. He couldn't come to Jerusalem. He couldn't come to Jonathan and at the king's palace. He was in hiding. He was restricted from... From, from, from being able to do that. And so Jonathan had to make the most of this moment. And by doing so, or making that even possible, he took the initiative to act. What we see here is that making the most of the moments that we have, it's about making a choice to act. 
Too many times when, when we have a thought, I should do this, or this person has a need and, and I can help them, we think, well, I'll wait until next time, right? I'll wait until tomorrow. I'll do it when it's more convenient. But making the most, it's a, it's a mindset that chooses to act. It's a, uh, it's a mindset that looks at every possible encounter that you have with another person as an opportunity to make a difference in their life. I'm going to take the initiative. I'm going to do this. I'm going to step out and I'm going to act. But the thing about taking the initiative that we have to understand is that it's never convenient, is it? Uh, very seldom is it convenient, actually. And I always say if you wait until it's convenient, it's probably not going to happen. And that's true about so many things in life, but especially when you're talking about making a difference in somebody else's life, if we wait until they make the first move, or if we wait until it's convenient, we're going to miss those opportunities. And as you think about your life, how many opportunities are missed simply because we don't take the initiative to act? This is especially challenging for me because I, I tend to want to step back and wait and observe. And, and, and God is always working in my heart. No, when I put them on your heart, act. Give them a call. Send them an email. If it's a friend that I know, uh, give them a call and tell them that you're praying for them. As we talked about, I believe last Sunday, of being aware, being sensitive to those promptings that the Holy Spirit puts in your heart. And that's part of what this kind of falls on the heel of that is, is God puts that in our hearts. We don't know why, but if we just wait until it's obvious, we're going to miss opportunities to do something that God wants us to do. And so making the most, if you want to make the most of the moments that you have with others, take the initiative to act. And that's what we see Jonathan doing here as he goes and he meets David while David is in hiding. He goes to his friend to encourage him. That leads us right into the second point, and that is if you're going to make the most of the moments that you have, is always strive to be an encourager with others. It says in verse 16 that Jonathan went to David and strengthened his hand in God. It's a phrase that, that it literally translated means to revive strength, um, to revive courage, or just simply in our English language, he went to encourage him, right? To... to Revive his courage. If you're going to encourage somebody, you're going to strengthen, you're going to build up their, what's the root word of encourage? Courage, right? It's, it's, it's not just make you feel happy, but it's to strengthen that courage. And so D, uh, Jonathan goes into this, these moments with the very specific intention to encourage David in the Lord. Paul Tripp reminds us in one of his a Wednesday Word devotionals, that biblical encouragement is, is not just telling somebody that everything's going to be okay. It, it's not just trying to uh, in, uh, lift their emotions temporarily. Biblical encouragement is so much deeper than that. And even more profound, it's biblical encouragement is helping people see Jesus. It's not just telling them it's going to be okay, but helping them see Jesus in the midst of what is not okay so that they know in the Lord everything will be okay, right? It's so much more than, than oftentimes what we do, the words that we say. Uh, well, well, just hang in there. Everything's going to be okay. Well, no. Hang in there, but see Jesus in the midst. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, right? When, when, when the king looked out to see the fiery furnace, it was as if there were how many in the furnace? Four, right? There was a fourth in the midst of them, right? God is with you in the midst of the fiery trial. He's with you in the midst of the trouble. Being a friend, being somebody that makes the most of the moments that you have with others, it, it helps people see Jesus in the midst of of the trouble. And that's what, Jesus, what this is what Jonathan does here for his friend David. He spoke courage into David's heart. He reminded David of God's protection and God's promises. Look now there at verse 16 again. It's, and Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horish and strengthened his hand in God. Verse 17. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you, and you shall be king 
over Israel. He reminds David of God's protection. God is protecting you. My Father, He will not find you. God is going to protect you. If you remember back to last week when we looked at the the conclusion of verse uh, 14, and Saul sought him every day, but what? But God would not give him into Saul's hands. God was protecting David. And David, uh, whatever was going on in his heart, we don't know exactly, but Jonathan comes and he reminds David of God's protection. God is going to protect you. Saul is not going to get you. He is not going to kill you. God is going to protect you. He reminds David of God's protection, but also he reminds David of God's promises. You will be king. You are the Lord's anointed. This is what God has promised. God is going to protect you. He's going to do what He's promised He will do. Do not be afraid. Be strengthened in the Lord. Remember, God is with you. And if you want to really make the most of the moments that you have with us, Go into these encounters with others with the, with the mindset to act. And as you act in those moments, make it a point to help them see Jesus in whatever may be going in there. Maybe they're not going through some deep struggle like David's going through. Maybe you just want to just be a blessing to them. Let them see Jesus in you, in your actions, in your words, in your commitment and in your sacrifices. Point them to Jesus. So take the initiative to act. Strive to always be an encourager. And by encourager, what we're looking at specifically is pointing them to Jesus. Because that's where all hope lies. Number three, if you want to make the most of the moments that you have, maintain a humble spirit. In verse 17, David reminds Uh, Jonathan reminds David, you shall be king over Israel. And then he says, I shall be next to you. There's a couple things happening here. One, we already referenced, this is an affirmation of the promises of God. You're going to be king. You are the anointed. You are going to be king. But he says, and I will be next to you. This isn't a statement of pride that I'm going to be your right-hand man, but rather it's a statement of humility on Jonathan's part because Jonathan is, by all natural rule, he is the next in line to be king. If so, when Saul dies, Jonathan was to be king. But by making the statement, I will be next to you, you will be king and I will be next to you, Jonathan is saying, I recognize and surrender myself to God's purposes. And what I see here as we look at this, as we see Jonathan's humility to recognize God's purposes, I see here a mindset that sometimes we struggle with when we look at interacting with others. You see, if you go into relationships seeking what you can get from somebody else, those relationships are generally going to be very shallow. What, what can they do for me? What can I get for them from them? And we go in with, with our desires, our goals, our intentions, um, our priorities. And those relationships are never going to go any deeper than what the other person can give to you. They tend to be very one-sided relationships. But humility, by its very nature, humility gives. Humility builds up. It lifts up. And so as we see here, Jonathan, he's building up his friend David as he humbles himself and submits himself to God's purposes. So if you're going to make the most of the moments that you have with others, keep a humble heart. Fourth thing in verse 18. It says, and the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horus, and Jonathan went home. Just be a true friend. If you want to make the most of the moments that you have with others, just be a friend to them. They may not be your best friend. They may not be anything more than acquaintance. This could be a total stranger that you've never met in your life before. But if you want to make the most of the moments that you have with others, just be a true friend. 
number of weeks ago when we looked at the details of David and Jonathan's friendship, when we talked about the principles of great friendship. We said that one of the marks of great friendship is a loyalty and a commitment to one another. As we see repeatedly David and Jonathan making a covenant before the Lord, marking or signifying their great friendship. And we said that we don't, you know, we don't write out contracts, right? We don't, we don't have a formal ceremony. You're going to be my best friend. I'm going to be your best friend. But we prove this kind of loyalty and commitment. We demonstrate it in our own lives on a daily basis when we simply choose to be a faithful friend, to be a good friend. We didn't spend a lot of time elaborating on what Scripture tells us what that is. I want to take just a few moments here to look at some Scripture passages to see what it means to prove yourself or to show yourself as a loyal and a faithful friend. It doesn't just mean be there when they need you, but it's so much more than that. All of this is marked, first of all, by love. Proverbs 17, 17 says that a friend, what? It loves at all times times and so if you're going to be a true friend to somebody all of your interactions all of your engagement with this person whether they are your best friend or a family member or whether they're a stranger that you meet on the streets all of those actions all of that time together has to be motivated by love a selfless love that seeks god's glory first and foremost and the benefit of the other a friend that loves at all times. Not just when it's convenient for you, not just when you can get something from the other person, but a friend loves at all times. Proverbs 18.24 says that there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And so there's this, uh, this desire with those that you're going to be friends with to, to engage them in a closer way. Not just keep everybody at a distance, right? I'm going to keep everybody at arm's length so nobody can get inside my, my, my uh, safety zone here, my, uh, my wall that I put up. I'm, I'm going to keep people at arm's length. But no, being a true friend means that you welcome them in closer to get to know them, uh, to let them get to know you. It is there for them at times of need. Proverbs 27, verse 6 also tells us that faithful are the wounds of a friend. Friends are not only there to build you up, to help you feel better, to to see Christ, but faithful friends also hold you accountable. Uh, Faithful friends may even cause you to have a wound in your pride, so to speak, right? They may wound you as they say, well, that's not right. You shouldn't have said that or, or done that. Uh, the wounds of a friend are, are faithful. They prove their faithfulness when they stand up for what is right and help hold you accountable for that in your own life. Proverbs 27.9 says, Oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Why, uh, wisdom shared with another person. Not just tell them what they want to hear so that they leave you alone, but genuine, honest wisdom coming from the Lord. That's a sweetness to anybody, but especially to friends. And I think one of the greatest examples of this kind of just being a true friend, especially outside of the, uh, the circles of somebody that like Jonathan and David who are best friends, but outside of that, I think one of the greatest examples comes from the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus says in Luke's account in Luke 10.36, he asks the question as, as he's laid out this parable, he says, which of these three, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, which three of these were the man's neighbor? Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Jewish man, the Israelite, who had been beaten up and robbed and left for dead, which of those three, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, which of them was this man's neighbor? And, if, and as I was thinking through this, I, I looked at this word neighbor for a moment. It's the Greek word plesion, which doesn't mean a whole lot to, to anybody. It doesn't mean a whole lot to me, except for the fact that this word plesion is translated neighbor in our English language but it also means a countryman or a friend. Jesus is essentially asking the people, which of these three men was this man's friend? And who was it? 
They, they, everybody knew as Jesus told this parable, it was the Samaritan. It was the one who demonstrated love, humility, sacrifice, and commitment to an individual that society said you should hate. And he proved himself and demonstrated that he was a genuine and true friend because of the way that he engaged the man who had been robbed. If you want to make the most of the moments that you have, just be a true friend to people. It doesn't mean they have to become your best friend. But show them that love, that commitment, that sacrifice that we find all throughout Scripture that ought to be a part of the relationship of friends. As I studied this text, I couldn't help but get a sense that one of the greatest responsibilities that are entrusted to our care are the opportunities that God gives us to make a difference in other people's lives. As Jesus tells the parable of the talents, He finishes in Matthew 25-23, and His Master said to Him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your Master. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's the statement that we say that we all long to hear when we see Jesus, right? We want to hear Jesus say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And when we think about being faithful with what God has given to us, oftentimes we think of our finances. Uh, we think of our, our abilities to do things. We think of um, our responsibility as parents in raising our children. We want to be faithful in that. We want to hear God say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But what about the opportunities that God gives to us to impact others that we might not think are, are essential or uh, as important as others? Making the most of these moments. There ought to be a, a conviction in our heart if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ and if we're going to stand before Him as faithful servants, there ought to be this conviction in our heart that says, I want to make the most of the moments that I have. Not for my benefit, not for my best life, but for God's honor and glory. In each of these encounters that we have with others, our friends, our families, our neighbors, our church members, person on the street that we don't know. Each of these encounters is an opportunity to lay up treasure in heaven for God's glory. And Jesus says to do what? Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And so as we take advantage and we make the most of the opportunities that we have, we are investing in the eternal. But we have to remember that our time is short, right? We don't know. We, we, we talk about that all the time. We, uh, we, 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 it was prayed about in prayer this morning and it just kind of just settled into my, into my heart as we were praying. Um, everybody's talking about what's going to happen next, right? What's, what's going to happen? We're, we, we have so many things that are changing in our culture and our society um, as, uh, as restrictions are, are, are increased or decreased happening as uh, seasons of life are, are, are coming and going and we're looking at are, are sports going to happen? How are they going to look like? What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen next week? I was thinking even this morning while we were singing, uh, just because this is the way my mind works, we sang a song that we've sung at Christmas this morning. We've, this morning we sang a song we've sung at Christmas before. And as we're singing that song, I'm thinking, December's coming really quick. Are we going to be able to have a Christmas service in the age of COVID? What's that going to look like? And then I had to make sure I wasn't too distracted and messed up all the slides. But, but we're thinking about what's going to happen in the future, right? We don't know. One thing we do know is that life is short and Jesus is coming again. Amen? We don't know the day or the hour. Only the Father knows. And what we can be sure of is the moments that we have right now, they are important. And we ought to make the most of them for His glory and for eternity. As we close this morning, 
I pray that that would be a, a, a burden that God places on your heart. And then we make a commitment this week as we go to make the most of the moments that God gives to you with others. Would you bow your heads with me as we close in a word of prayer? God, I pray this morning that as we, as we continue to meditate and think on the truth of Your Word and the examples that we find here in Scripture, I pray that You'd impress upon our hearts this, not just the brevity of life and the shortness of it, but, but Lord, the, the ways in which we can make the most of the time that You have given to us and that You will give to us. Lord, this is not something that ought to depress or discourage us, but it ought to increase our excitement, deepen our purpose in these days that we have. Lord, we don't know when Your return may come. The things that are happening in this world all around us all point that the day is coming very quickly. It is a day that we're looking forward to. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. But Lord, yet we still have time here on this earth and you have a purpose and a plan for it may we be faithful in making the most of that time especially in regards to the people that you have placed in our lives help us this week to be committed to making the most of those moments for your honor and glory and it's in jesus name that we pray amen